What's up, guys? Welcome back to Sit Down with Sid podcast. This is episode number 26. Our guest today is a Dublin based Irish singer, songwriter, currently signed to BEO Records Home to the first lady of Celtic music, Moya Brennan. His first two solo releases, Your Endless Slumber, A Voice for the Urban Darlings, both reached number one in the Irish charts at the time of their release. With that being said, all the way from Ireland, let me welcome Calm Gavin. Hi, Calm. Thanks for being Thanks, with us. Sid. Pleasure, pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, so before we dive into, you know, your singing career, would you kind of, you know, unpack a little bit about, you know, your background and uh, where you grew and, you know, so our audience knows. Absolutely. So I was born and raised in Dublin. I suppose with regards to music, my education in music started when I was about 12 or 13 years of age in the Clondalkin School of Music. And I was blessed. I had a wonderful teacher, Peter Stanton. And Peter, I tend to describe him as being as old world as the, as the modern day 21st century would allow. He was an incredible man. I remember the first time I met him, he just looked like he just looked like he stepped out of a Roald Dahl novel, you know, blue, blue cords with a perfect seam and a gentleman's burgundy shoe. He always looked impeccable. You could set your watch to him. He was a musician, a consummate musician through and through. And he was my teacher for about 15 years. So that pretty much covers the educational or the academic side of music for me. And then in terms of performance, I started out busking on Grafton Street when I was about 15 or 16, which is kind of a rite of passage for a lot of Irish performers and a lot of Irish singer songwriters in particular, which I suppose it's very hard to quantify what one does. but um, I would consider myself to be a singer songwriter first and foremost before I'm anything else. Great. So, so let me ask you, Tom. So, what made you decide uh, to pursue a career in the music industry? From the time I was about eleven or twelve, I was just fascinated with the way music worked. I, my mother and father aren't musicians, but they're big musical enthusiasts, I suppose you could say. And I remember as a kid hearing Elton John records and Van Morrison records and just being fascinated with the storytelling aspect of it first and foremost, but then what a, a good melody can do. And a good melody is like a smell. It's like a fragrance. It instantly takes us back to a time and a place, memories, be they good or bad, sorrowful or something to rejoice in. And that still to this day, that, that the power of that has never left me. And it was that in, it was that captivation, even as a kid, that just drew me right into this idea that you can create melodies, symphonic harmony, glue it all together. And it's like painting. It's like painting with painting with music, but but it's it's painting an image first and foremost for the mind. So so I mean, so that being said, I want to ask you, like, what do you classify yourself as? Meaning what kind of style do you have as a singer you know well i suppose it, it's it's a very generic term but singer songwriter is the way i describe mm -hmm. it so and now when i say that i think of people like jerome kern george mm -hmm. and ira gershwin cole porter in it like someone who writes and performs their own material in the simplest sense of the word i could i could go further into that and say there's elements of jazz and blues and that kind of thing but i find it genres especially with relating to singer songwriters can be very limiting and mm -hmm. you might you might expect one thing and then you listen to my music and you're like this is nothing like anything i expected so i try to keep it as open and loose as possible when i'm describing it so i suppose singer songwriter is the best way to to define what it is i am and what i do perfect so before i dive into the uh your new album the 1992 tapes I'm going to go back and talk about your two first solo releases, which I mentioned in the intro as well. So they both reached number one in the Irish charts. So did you ever expect that to happen? And when it happened, what did it feel like to you? No, and, and even now, Sid, it's almost impossible to talk about it because it's one of those things that it's, it's too hard for the mind to quantify. You, when I started out, my, my biggest hope when I first began studying music would be that there would be enough people interested enough in what I do that they want to come to concerts that I put on. Now, by that, I mean, 
couple of hundred people. I wasn't thinking in terms of stadiums or anything like that. And so the charts were never on my radar. That was never the driving force behind me wanting to make music. So when it did happen, it was even now talking about it. It's it's just such a strange thing. But the way I look at it is if it opens up more people to my music uh, and people that enjoy the kind of music that I make, which it's kind of a it's a very specific it's very listener specific in terms of it's not pop music. It doesn't sound like top 20 records that are being made today. So if if by getting into the charts, it means opening up to more people who would potentially like my music, well, then that's a positive to me. So is it fair to say that that achievement was kind of a pinnacle of you realizing that I have something special in me? To this day, I doubt whether I have something special. I think what I try to ascribe to is the idea that hard work beats talent every time. It's it's timing and precision, but it's it's a it's a conglomeration of of hard work built up over years. So I would have been, and my teacher would would wholeheartedly agree with this, or would have agreed with this, that I'm not the most naturally gifted musician. Anything that I know how to do now. I studied it. Um, musical academia has been a huge part of my of, of my background. I know there's a lot of musicians which you do that it nudges it into the public zeitgeist. Um, that's always a huge compliment. There's no doubt. Great. So so let's talk about your album 1992 tapes. So I just want audience to know that it reached the number one spot in the Irish singer songwriter charts. Fourth in the pop charts, 56 in the Billboard 100 in the US and 81st in the Italian pop charts. I mean, those are some great accolades, you know. Uh, so, I mean, number one is how did you come up with this name? And I mean, there has to be some inspiration for you to come up with this album. What was that? The, I think the driving force behind making this record was I wanted to show to the listener And I still don't even know if there's that many people who are curious about the creative side, but what a song sounds like at the time of its inception or its conception. So it's just myself and the piano, nothing else. There's no frills. There's no added instruments. If you listen to my first album, A Voice for the Urban Darlings, there's loads of different instrumentation, banjo, uh, bass guitar, different layered synths and harmonies. This is just the song and me performed on the piano as simply as I could do it. And I owe a huge debt of gratitude to Brian O'Dwyer and Alan Thornton, who with their skills, were just able to bring out something in the songs that I suppose that's their gift, isn't it? As as producers and and, and experts of what they do, that they can take the songs to a completely different level. But I suppose the inspiration behind it, really, I just wanted to, to deliver these songs in their simplest form. No frills, no added instruments or big elaborate post-production, just the songs as they arrived into the world. So I want to like kind of get in your head right now as a songwriter, like mm-hmm. when composing a song, do you ever come across a scenario if you should start with the lyrics first or the choice of the music or other way around? Like what's your mindset? I mean, to come up with something you know, randomly and then tie all of that together. I mean, that's, that's, that's really like great, you know, so can you tell us a little bit more about that? I think it was Leonard Cohen who said, if I know where the good songs came from, I'd go there more often. I think there's the only formula is that there's no formula. Sometimes it's a lyrical idea that sparks a melodic idea, but John Lennon said 99% of this job is just showing up at the desk. I think if you're willing to give over a certain amount of time every day, if you think of it, there's bands who they decide we're going to rehearse for three hours a week, once a week. Well, there's how many hours in a week? You're only going to rehearse for three. That, you know, it's not a great formula for success. And the same is true with songwriters. I think if you only wait until you're inspired to write something, you could be waiting a long time. So I try to make the appointment of just being at the piano for three or four or five hours a day it's usually four hours max it's about as much as oh, I can wow. do. it's about as much as i can do before my mind just there's the law of diminishing returns that kicks in where ideas actually stop and you, your inner critic takes over and nothing sounds good or 
you you won't get that final lyric to finish the stanza so i i usually make for about three and a half to four hours five or six days a week just to be at the piano and to to work through different ideas both lyrical and musical and then if i'm collaborating with somebody that obviously there's deadlines to meet and it, it's it's more than just my expectations that are on the line so i have to be considerate of the other person too it's a delicate process and i think time goes by is you know very very quickly so as long as you're willing to make the time and sit with it it it's a craft that it, you you naturally get better over time the more time you put into it so is it like do you have a so i mean when you're sitting on piano for 3 4 hours a day you start playing piano lyrics come to your mind mm -hmm. do you kind of like do that like do you play that in your head or do you write those down and then do you go back the next day to see if it rhymes it does not rhyme how does that process work I, i'm really curious you know i i try never to leave an idea unfinished because typically if you half finish an idea or you get like a quarter of an idea done you won't come back to it and finish it you'll usually discard that idea in favor of something else so i try to finish everything i start it always begins at the piano I don't have this sense of urgency. I'm not sitting on the bus on the way into town and I get an idea and I've got to frantically take it down very quickly. I, I make notes. Mm -hmm. I, you know, my, my iPhone is full of different lyrical ideas, but usually I never go back to them. It's, it's what happens in the moment at the piano. Once I get, once I have an idea. So if I want to do something that sounds like a 12 bar blues and I have some form of a narrative in my head of where I wanted to go. I try and stay with it until it's done. If I hate the song, I can always discard it, but at least I have something finished and fully formed. So, so Calm, let me ask you one thing. How competitive is this singing songwriting industry in Ireland? Now it's, I think as a, as a collective, it's healthier than it's ever been because with the advent of the internet and home computers and stuff like that, the last 20 to 25 years has seen just a surge of people who are who can work from home no longer mm -hmm. do you have to commit yourself to booking studio time and working with a certain producer there's so many of these little tricks of the trade that now you can you can record at home you can record in your bedroom in your attic in your spare room in your kitchen so i think that's kind of brought to life this age of the diy songwriter so it's it's hugely competitive but i think whether it's 1936 or 2022 a good song is a good song and it'll reach if if there's quality it'll always reach people so 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 that being said what separates you from the rest of the pack i find that the more we look for differences the mm -hmm. more similarities we find um i i like anybody else all i'm interested in is finding people who are interested enough in what i do that they'd mm -hmm. like to come see it in concert, whether that's in Dublin, New York, Boston, Bangladesh, West Virginia, it doesn't matter. Um, and, and yet, when you look at the evolution of music, rock and roll comes from blues music. Rock and roll today doesn't mean what it meant in 1956. So things are constantly evolving. And, and, and there's so many artists today who now are clicking in with musical ideas of the 50s and 60s that were established by people like Buddy Holly, Roy Orbison, and, and they're bringing it into the modern day. So like I said, I think the more we look for differences, the more we find similarities. I just think it's a really exciting time to be a singer songwriter and to be making music. Amazing. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about your 1992 tapes. Um, I'm sure as a singer yourself, there must be one song that's probably your most favorite. Uh, which one is that and, and why? It's difficult because I think songs are like children that never know their parents. You know, my, my songs don't know that I exist, for, you know, from, from one breath to the next. But at the same time, there's a, you know, if I didn't love them all equally, they wouldn't go on the record. But the opening track, I always will, which is, I like to think if Disney had have cast me to write the music for Up, this is the song that would have gone in the movie. That's got a there's a deep sentimental attachment to that for me, but it's difficult to choose. And, and they've each, because they're, they're all singles, the five tracks are, are singles from the record. They've all had lives of their own that don't necessarily connect with one another. So it's very difficult to choose, but I always will as a special one. 
All was well, great. Uh, I want to ask you one thing, Tom. Once again, it's my curiosity, you know. So when you write a song, do you have any song that relates to your personal life as well? Stemming from your childhood to your, you know, where you are. And I mean, some kind of an idea it brings into, you know, kind of reality. Absolutely. I think even the songs that writers will typically say aren't autobiographical, there's always some aspect of your life that informs the song in one way or another. Otherwise, it's very difficult to write about different experiences. And and a lot of times with myself, I, I use the argument that I take the approach of a short story writer. I'm not necessarily in my songs, nor what I think the people would, would want me to be. And I do think that allows a certain amount of freedom when you're not limited to what you've experienced. But there's no doubt if you're writing about subject matter like obvious things like love youthful romance and all that kind of stuff there's there's a certain amount of your life that does that does come into play there's no doubt wow uh come i actually read uh you know that about you the years of discipline in the bars and clubs of dublin have helped shape your song ring, song writing capabilities how does that resonate to your singing career or where you are as of today? Like it's our experiences, our most formative experiences that do shape the people that we are. And I think as a performer, that's your pedigree. For me, it was, it was obviously where, where I learned to perform was, was busking on the streets in Dublin and, and performing mm-hmm. in, in bars and clubs of my hometown. And those experiences, be they positive or negative, I think are what shape your appreciation, you know, if, if success finds you, mm-hmm. it's that pedigree, it's that upbringing of having worked nights where you don't particularly feel like it, difficult crowds, um, sometimes to nobody, sometimes to three or four people, and you just need to do it for the money. But it's those experiences that shape you. Mm-hmm. And if and when success does find an artist, that's what gives you varying degrees of appreciation for it, I think. Amazing. And I want to talk about your performance. So you performed in the legendary Birdland Jazz Club in New York City. Uh, how was it? How was it as a singer doing your performance there? What were your expectations, and and how positive, or what was the feedback from from like the audience? You know. Well, it all occurred because of Jim Caruso, who is a wonderfully gifted individual. He runs a night in Birdland called Cast Party. And it was around, I mean, it was coming very close to Christmas. This is only about three or four weeks ago, so it's still very fresh okay. in the memory. Um, and Jim was gracious enough to invite me to perform at the event. It was a Monday night in, in New York City. And I think the venue alone, the just the history of the place, the people who've been associated with it, Miles Davis... Coltrane, Chef Baker, Art Tatum. It, it, that's overwhelming enough to begin with. But then when you have such a, a gorgeous audience as, as was there on the night, it was uh, it was very, it, it, again, it's hard to quantify things like that because I've always been, th- that's never something that was on my radar. That was just one of those gifts that life throws at you from time to time. But it was a magic so experience. Were you, so were you nervous? Like when you oh, absolutely. Recorded? Absolutely. But there's... From years of, of, of doing it, there's a there's a mechanism that kicks in that I mm-hmm. might be petrified, but I can put a bit of distance between me and what I feel to just get the job done. But but the audience were wonderful. And Billy Stritch, who, again, an astounding musician who people will know from his days with Liza Minnelli, he kind of he's at the helm at the piano mm-hmm. there and. It's just a wonderful environment. I mean, I'd recommend it for anybody who finds themselves on West 44th Street on Monday night to check out Cast Party. But it was a real honor. There's no doubt. So do you kind of zone out yourself from the audience like to overcome your nervousness or or do you kind of or does the audience kind of become an inspiration for you there and you kind of, you know, it's just like tying in melodies, you know? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think it's a combination of both. To begin with, like a lot of people will say, it takes three or four songs for you to really get into the swing of things. And oh I, wow! I I agree with that. I mean, it, I like, I think, unless I'm having a really good night, it takes me 
two or three songs to really start to soak up the room. To begin with, I think I think for most performers, if there's any amount of anxiety or nervousness in you, you, you don't want to pay too much attention to the room because um, that's energy that you have to feed off of. But when you have a great audience too, that that's certainly uplifting. There's no doubt. Wow. So in your eyes, what is one of the best performances so far of your career? I think there's a few and mm-hmm. usually it's usually it's got to do with like Birdland was special because I grew up with just idolizing artists who, who are so synonymous with with the venue and, and and that come from a time in music where not only I wasn't alive, but I don't know anybody who was around at that time. So it, it takes on kind of a mythical quality. But I, I suppose playing to big rooms of people so there's a venue in dublin called vicar street mm-hmm. and i remember playing there for the first time and that's a venue that holds about maybe 1500 or 2000 people and mm-hmm. again like i said I, I had very modest ambitions as a teenager when i started playing music like i would have been delighted with 200 300 people in a room but to play to to play to a large amount of people like that is it's it's a huge buzz Again, if you're nervous at all, that's going to be multiplied depending on how many people are there. But uh, yeah, there's a few, but that's that's definitely one of them. So I, I, I don't want to miss this. I want to talk about you uh, being currently signed to the BEO Records, home to the first lady of Celtic music, Moya Brennan. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about this BEO Records and, and how did this... Uh, successful partnership come in place if you're allowed to absolutely so i signed with bio records in november of 2015 okay. and bio bio records is run by tim jarvis and his wife moya brennan and moya international audiences as well as irish audiences will know moya for her work with Clannad, which is the family group people will also be familiar with enya so enya is moya's sister I signed with Bio in November of 2015, but they've just been, I, I think all an artist can ever ask for in a record label is one that just allows you a degree of creative freedom that isn't stifling. You know, when, once once you can enjoy freedom of expression to the point where it doesn't impede on what you do creatively, which in so many cases it does, and, and that's usually indicative of major labels, not always, but a lot of the time it's, there's very little that you could ask for more than that. And Tim and Moya from the time I've signed right up until today have just been eternally supportive and never, never try to untangle the creative knots that they're dealing with, which there are plenty with me. They, they're happy to just, whatever the content is to, to put it out through the label. And like, as an artist, there's very little, there's, there's not a whole lot more you could ever ask for than that. So, so as far as your uh, performances are concerned overseas, do they play a major role in kind of organizing all of that with the other companies or like in terms of partnership? Or is that something you do it yourself and then they kind of, you know, like you tell them I'm representing you guys as well. How does that work? So Bio Records really just deals with putting out the music that I make. So if I bring gotcha. out a record okay. like, like the 1992 tapes or a voice for the urban darlings or a single day make sure that, that so our online distributor is a train music they're based in san francisco bio okay. based in ireland so they just handle the distribution aspect of the music getting it to spotify it. amazon music and all that kind of thing other things like concerts you would deal like overseas and, and nationally would be done through an agency but but bio are great like they're they're happy to help in whatever way they can be it musical distribution or otherwise awesome uh i want to know do you have any one person if i wanted to ask you come name one person who is an anchor in shaping your senior career and personality who would that be and why would you choose that person to be an anchor to your to your career i think undoubtedly my music teacher peter stanton was peter stanton uh, he was he was it 100%. He was my teacher for 15 years. And he instilled in me a love of melody, 
of musical composition like he, he by way of introduction he opened up my eyes to artists who today have have played such a huge role in shaping the musical landscape of my life but he was a mentor he was a friend when i needed one mm. Like I said, mm-hmm. I studied with Peter for 15 years. Unfortunately, he passed away around this time last year, which was a, a huge loss. And I feel and I know I echo the sentiments of all of his students that he left a gaping hole in all of our lives. But he was I considered him one of my best friends. And he to answer your question, he. He definitely. He definitely was somebody he, he was an anchor in my life, and I think always will be, too. Well, I'm, I'm sure he is definitely proud even he's watching you, you know, so Thanks, uh, definitely. Uh, I have a couple of things I want to talk about. Uh, you are also presently co-writing with one of Ireland's most notable and beloved song renders, songwriters, Charlie McGettigan. Mm-hmm. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? How did that come to fruition? And, uh, you know, a little bit about uh, Charlie as well. So at the beginning of the pandemic, around April or May in 2020, Charlie sent me a message rather out of the blue and and said, if you'd be interested in co-writing, that'd be great and it'd be something Mm -hmm. I'd love to do. And from that point, primarily because we had so much free time over the space of the early portion of the pandemic during lockdown and stuff like that, we would we would write two, two, maybe three songs a week. And and we've we've continued that writing partnership all the way through 2020 and 2021. I think we've amassed maybe 60 or 70 songs that we've written together. And Charlie, most of your viewers will know Charlie as one half of McGettigan Harrington, who won Eurovision Mm -hmm. in 1994 for Ireland. That was kind of the hat trick for us. That was the third time in a row that we'd won the Eurovision. But Charlie, Charlie's a master. He's a master craftsman. He embodies for me, what it is to be a songwriter, someone who, like I said, makes the appointment every day, it's it's throughout him. It's his very essence is is, is musical creativity, and I've I've learned a huge amount from him. Great. Uh, so, come like, what's next for you? Where do you see yourself? Where you are today? Do you have any plans in terms of performances? And where do you see yourself as a singer in the next three to five years? Well, look, my next my next goal is to make another record. So, okay, I'm hope I'm hoping in the next month or so to get back in the studio, and to make a new record, which hopefully will be up maybe May June of this year. Mm-hmm. We're like internationally, we're keeping our head above the parapet again, and and rest- COVID restrictions are starting to loosen on a global level. So, I don't. Like I've got my fingers crossed. I don't want to hope too much because every time we sure. get our expectations up, we seem to get them slammed back down fairly quickly. So I, I'm hope like I'm hoping for normality. That's what I got my fingers crossed for. Um, but the minute we can take international bookings, that's that's really the aim. Just to get back on the road again and to hopefully have another record out by May, maybe June, and yeah, just just to just to return to what life was like before 2020. So, so, so once the record comes out, do you promote it locally, say per se in Ireland, and then you choose different overseas destinations or how, how do you map out the whole thing? Yeah. So it usually happens all at once. Like the beauty of Spotify and Amazon music and iTunes now is that mm-hmm. once it's out in Ireland, it's out everywhere. So okay. that, that, that aspect of it makes negotiating the question of international promotion much easier because you know, it happens here, it happens everywhere all at the one time. So uh, every record has its its challenges and every record, I try and set myself goals for what I want the next one to do and the next one to do. But I'm just, I'm really grateful to be making music and to be living the life that I do. So I try to keep gratitude at the forefront of everything. Love it. Come, uh, a couple of things before uh, we wrap this up. Uh, I had listened to your song, Your Little Corner of the Moon. Uh, if if we have the permission, uh, would you be okay for us to posting at least a couple of minutes from that video in this podcast so people can actually admire your talent and actually get to, you know, hear your voice? Yeah, absolutely. No problem. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So we will do that. And, and you're also available on Spotify, YouTube, 
uh, record label management, SoundCloud, and we are going to put all the descriptions of those links in the in the video as well, so people can find more about you. Uh, last but not the least, uh, if you were to give a message to the audience watching this podcast, what would that be? A closing statement. Probably some of the best advice I ever got was, I'd rather be a failure on my own terms than a success on somebody else's. I think if there's something that you're passionate about, do it on your terms and don't compromise what it is that you that you want to achieve or what it is that you want it to look like. At the end of the day, it's you're going to win or lose based on your own efforts. So don't be disappointed with the results that you get from the work you don't put in. But I think most importantly, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, keep gratitude at the at the forefront of everything that you do. And it's hard, it's hard to go wrong with with an approach like that. That's amazing. Uh, Calm, this has been a blast. I really had a great time uh, having this conversation with you and I wish you nothing but success and, you know, lots and lots of success and performances in the coming year. And, uh, you know, once again, I want to thank you very much for your time. Pleasure, Sid. And thank you. It was great to chat with you. Thank you so much. You have a good day. Thanks, Calm. Thanks, Bye-bye. Sid. Thank- Guys, here is the song, Your Little Corner of the Moon by Calm Gavin. I am going to leave this in the end. I hope you like it. And let's wish him all the best. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Take care. Bye-bye. Seven wonders in this world Then you must be the eighth She said I only ordered rice Now it seems there's cheese here on my plate I said I guess that's not the kind of thing That you'd hear on a first date But if I didn't say it now I never will She had the kind of eyes that poets from Alaska right about That could freeze you with one glance But that you'd burn inside without And as her feet would glide down Main Street All the boys would scream and shout I hope there's someone out there screaming for her still And all the girls eat mashed potatoes As I swallow humble pie Problem shared is a problem still I don't need to tell you why Her cage door's standing open But she won't rest until she flies To her little corner of the moon It was late September, I recall There was gold beneath our feet By circumstance I learned to dance In her arms out in the street And the fragrance of her hair Gave off the taste of something sweet I'd have stayed right there forever If I could She said that love is like a lottery As the red lights fade to blue I don't know what it is I'm searching for But tonight perhaps it's you Still I don't want the kind of heart That sticks to my shirt sleeves like glue And then she kissed me like she thought I understood That all the girls eat mashed potatoes As I swallow humble pie A problem shared is a problem still I don't need to tell you why Her cage door is standing open, but she won't rest until she flies to her little corner of the moon. I wanted to say from the time we started, I'm not only here till the rain has parted. For you and everything you do If 
you can do that too Oh, but she just sighed and said Think of us as passing ships That were never meant to sail There's such a high price for the quiet life And my freedom's not for sale I'm like a wild wind that can't reduce itself to a passing summer gale If this were any other time for you I would It's only three weeks since she left But there's a cold chill in the air There's not a trace of her on Main Street But I still see her everywhere Mama told me she'll come back, son, if you just act like you don't care Still I know this time goodbye meant bye for good And all the girls eat mashed potatoes as I swallow humble pie A problem shared is a problem still, I don't need to tell you why but every night it seems in my wildest dreams It is always she and I 